Hello, hockey fans, and welcome back to another video. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few days, you know that the remainder of the current NHL season has been put on hold, due to that virus that's going around, which I can't name, or YouTube will demonetize my video. With so many sporting events and other public gatherings around the world being paused temporarily or even stopped completely, I figured I would use this newfound opportunity to delve into the hockey history books and explore the previous instances when the NHL season was either delayed, postponed, or even cancelled entirely. So in today's video, allow me to take you through the five other times the National Hockey League stopped play. Let's explore these events in chronological order and start right back at the very beginning with the 1919 Stanley Cup Finals. In late May 1919, the NHL champions the Montreal Canadiens and the winners of the Pacific Coast Hockey Association, the now defunct Seattle Metropolitans, had spent the past 10 days battling it out over five games during the 1919 Stanley Cup Finals in order to get their hands on the trophy. With both teams taking a pair of wins and one game ending in a tie after double overtime, the sixth and final game of the series was set to decide the winner of the 1919 championship. However, on April 1st, just five and a half hours before puck drop, health officials cancelled the game due to several players falling ill with the Spanish flu, a strain of influenza that affected 500 million people around the world and is estimated to have killed as many as 50 million of those infected. Montreal's roster was the worst affected of the two, with five members of their team either being hospitalised or sick in bed, with fevers as high as 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, the virus would claim the lives of several members on the Canadians, as defenseman Joe Hall would succumb to a bout of pneumonia caused by the flu just four days later, whilst Montreal's manager, George Kennedy, would never fully recover from the flu and pass away a few years later. At the time, Kennedy wanted to forfeit the finals and give Seattle the Stanley Cup, as it was the Canadians' lineup that was short staffed but Metropolitan's manager-slash-coach Pete Muldoon refused to accept the cup victory as it was the disease that caused the team to forfeit, not the team itself. Kennedy had even asked to use players from the PCHA's team in Victoria in order to help finish the series, but the league president refused the request, likely due to the danger that the players would have been placed in. With the final game being unable to be played and neither team willing to accept a forfeit, it was decided that the Stanley Cup would not be awarded in 1919 and neither team would be engraved on the trophy. This final series would be left unmentioned on the Cup and almost forgotten in time until 1948, when a new collar was added to the Cup which included a reference to the two finalists stating that the 1919 series between the Canadians and the Metropolitans was simply not completed. Of all the stoppages we are going to explore in this video, this is by far the worst and likely the most relatable to what's going on right now, so I figured we'd get it out of the way first and move on to less fatal examples as quickly as possible. You can thank me later, folks. We're going to jump ahead 73 years now and take a look at the first and only general strike in NHL history, the 1992 Players' Strike. Midway through the 91-92 NHL season, the newly appointed executive director of the NHL Players' Association, Bob Goodenough, was tasked with negotiating a new collective bargaining agreement with the league's owners, after the previous CBA had expired at the beginning of the season. The hot topic issues to discuss for this new agreement included free agency and how it would be operated, the salary arbitration process, playoff bonuses for players, and pensions for players after they retired. However, the biggest roadblock to successfully finding a deal ended up being 
how the revenue from trading card sales would be distributed between the owners and the players, with owners demanding a bigger slice of the pie. When the players voted to reject the league's final offer by a count of 560 to 4, on April 1st, 1992, Goodenow announced that the players would be walking out and going on strike, claiming that the owners didn't take the players or their demands seriously. Given that the season was already underway, the players felt that they were in a position of power since most teams made their profits for the entire year during the playoffs, profits that the players would barely see. It was estimated that at the time, players would receive $3,000 each if they were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs, and up to $25,000 if they went all the way and won the Stanley Cup. In comparison, owners would approximately earn up to $500,000, not for the entire postseason, but per playoff game. After nine days of strike action, on April 10th, the two sides agreed on a new two-year deal, retroactive to the beginning of the season, and the strike came to an end. The season resumed play and the final 30 games of the season, as well as the playoffs, got underway, with Mario Lemieux and the Pittsburgh Penguins taking the 1992 Stanley Cup Championship. In the new agreement, most of the key issues were resolved. The players received a large increase in playoff bonuses, whilst changes to both free agency and the arbitration process were made. In addition, the number of regular season games was expanded from 80 games to 84, with each team playing two regular season games in a neutral arena in order to gauge interest in further expansion of the league. Following the strike, NHL president John Ziegler was replaced at the conclusion of the season by the owners, who promptly named Gil Stein interim president. One year later, in 1993, Stein would be replaced by the current commissioner and everyone's favourite man to boo, Gary Bettman. So it seems that this strike led to the owners taking the players and their demands more seriously, and showed us that the owners haven't always got their way. Even though he wasn't directly involved, you just knew that Gary Bettman would have to be around there somewhere, lurking in the shadows like some sort of movie villain. We now move on to the most commonly known stoppages in the league's history, the lockouts. Let's start with the first of these three, the 1994-95 lockout. Less than two years after the players' strike and the new collective bargaining agreement was signed, the NHL needed another new CBA after playing the previous season without one. Some of the issues that prevented a new deal being signed included how free agency was handled moving forwards and owners wanting to limit the rapidly escalating salaries of players. The biggest issue, though, was the suggestion of the implementation of a salary cap. In short, the owners wanted it as it would limit how much teams could spend but the players didn't, as it limited how much they could earn. The owners then suggested a luxury tax where teams would receive a financial penalty for salaries higher than average, but the players refused that too, as it was too similar to a salary cap. With the two sides unable to come to an agreement before the beginning of the season, on October 1st, 1994, it was announced that the National Hockey League would be putting its season on hold as it was undergoing a lockout. As the weeks dragged on, and with the two sides still unable to agree, the salary cap debate took a back seat in favour of discussing other items, such as a rookie salary cap, changes to the arbitration system, and loosened free agency rules. Both parties did agree on one big issue though, and that was the smaller market teams and their need to be sustained. The league wanted to tie player salaries to revenue in order to subsidise the operation of financially weaker teams, whilst the NHL Players Association felt that revenue sharing would achieve the bulk of the financial goals the league wanted to reach and would also help the smaller market teams in the process. However, the league's larger market teams eventually broke negotiations as they feared the revenue lost from this extended lockout 
would outweigh the long-term benefits of a salary cap, and they didn't want to be the first league in North America to forfeit an entire season just to help out the smaller market teams who couldn't pull their weight. After over three months without hockey, on January 11th, 1995, it was announced that the lockout had finally come to an end, as the two parties had agreed on a new CBA. As a result, the 94-95 NHL season was shortened from 84 games to 48, with the total games from next season onward dropping from 84 to 82, with the season running from January 20th to May 3rd, the only time the NHL season has ever played games in the month of May. Well, maybe until this year. Though hockey was back, the lockout had done its fair share of damage. A total of 468 regular season games were lost as a result of the lockout, as well as the 1995 All-Star game. The loss of revenue from months without NHL hockey eventually forced three different NHL franchises to relocate to other cities. First, the Quebec Nordiques in 1995 to become the Colorado Avalanche, then the Winnipeg Jets in 1996 to become the Phoenix Coyotes, and lastly the Hartford Whalers in 1997 to become the Carolina Hurricanes. If you think that lockout was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. On to the worst lockout of the three, as next is the 0405 lockout. The beginnings of this stoppage stem from both the owners and the players' association being unable to come to terms on a new CBA after the previous one expired. The points of contention included the implementation of a salary cap and the owners wanting player salaries to be linked to league revenues in order to achieve cost certainty, whilst the Players Association wanted an alternative system of revenue sharing. Tell me if I'm repeating myself. Unlike the lockout prior though, neither side was willing to back down enough to reach a compromise. Both sides would send offer after offer with a salary cap number, whether it was linked to league revenue or revenue shared, as well as other money or clauses used as benefits or incentives to make the other side accept, but it would always be rejected. This back and forth for months on end led to the announcement in February 2005 that the entire 0405 NHL season would be cancelled, becoming the first and only season in North American sports history so far to be completely cancelled. It also marked the first time that the Stanley Cup would not be awarded at the end of the year to a team since the 1919 Spanish flu epidemic. After talks picked back up during the summer and marathon negotiation sessions between the two sides increased in frequency, on July 13th, 2005, 10 months after the lockout began, the league announced that the two sides had finally reached an agreement with the lockout officially coming to an end nine days later on July 22nd, after the final ratifications were made to the deal. As a result of these negotiations, a salary cap as well as a salary floor would be implemented, but the cap would be adjusted each year to guarantee that the players would receive 54% of the NHL's total revenue. The players' share would increase if revenue rose to specific benchmarks, while revenue sharing would ensure a pool of money filled by the 10 highest grossing teams would be split among the bottom 15 teams in order to keep as many franchises as profitable as possible. In the aftermath of this lockout, the NHLPA executive director Bob Goodenow, regarded as one of the biggest villains in this ordeal because of his refusal to implement a salary cap, resigned from his position five days after the agreement was ratified. However, fans still weren't happy that the sport they loved had been taken away from them thanks to a bunch of men in suits and their desire for money. Some fans were so upset that they went as far as to reach a settlement on February 7th, 2006, which stated that the Stanley Cup could be awarded to non-NHL teams should the league not operate for an entire season ever again. P. 
people really do care about hockey's greatest trophy, don't they, folks? Well, considering the section of the cup for the 0405 season just says season not played, you can understand why people were mad. To finish up this video, last but certainly not least, let's take a look at the most recent lockout to date, the 2012-13 lockout. Once again, the owners and the players association wanted to make some changes to the previous collective bargaining agreement, but couldn't agree on which things to change. The owners wanted to reduce the players 57% share of guaranteed league revenue down to 43%, introduce new term limits on contracts, including four years for new players, five years for entry-level contracts, and ten years for unrestricted free agents, eliminate salary arbitration, and change the rules of free agency, whilst the Players Association wanted to retain the current salary cap, but delink it from total revenue. Instead, they proposed a fixed salary cap for three years, followed by an option to return to the previous CBA in year 4, claiming it could save the league up to $465 million, as well as enhance the revenue sharing system that would continue to help lower revenue teams stay afloat. When the previous CBA expired, and the two sides couldn't come to terms on a new deal, another lockout began on September 15th, 2012. 119 days of offers and counter-offers ensued, with each side willing to budge just a little, but the other side rejecting it as they didn't budge enough. This continued until January 6th, 2013, when a new potential CBA was reached. This new deal included a host of changes benefiting both sides, including an 8-year limit on contract extensions, a 7-year limit on new contracts, a new salary floor and salary cap, mandatory acceptance of arbitration awards under $3.5 million, and an amnesty period to buy out contracts that do not fit under the new cap. The deal was finalised on January 9th, and the season got underway 10 days later on January 19th. The league schedule was reduced for that season from its usual 82 games to 48, with no interconference games, and the Chicago Blackhawks were eventually crowned the 2013 Stanley Cup champions. With all these lockouts and negotiations and business terms making my brain feel fuzzy, let's just hope there's not another one in the near future. This virus is already bad enough. And that was a look at the five other times the NHL stopped play. What do you guys think about these stoppages, especially the lockouts? Do you think they helped make it fairer for both the owners and the players in the long term, or was it just a bunch of millionaires arguing over nothing? Let me know in the comments below, I would love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye! A big thank you to Chris Gadsby, Connor B, Paul Malia, Jordan Whitehead, and Martin Tolnus, as well as a huge thank you to Max Artis for helping support this video via Patreon. If you too want to help support the channel a little bit further, and get a shout out at the end of every future video, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash oddmanrush and become a patron today.